Hello and welcome to the online service for St Mary's Church in Ely. My name is Ruth and I'm one of the team at St Mary's and Christchurch. And whoever you are, wherever you're from, you are really welcome here as we join together to worship God. Through Lent, we are looking at the book of Acts and specifically the first five chapters of Acts. In those chapters, we read of the earliest church, which was in Jerusalem, the earliest believers responding to the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. We'll be seeing what we can learn from this early church of how we can be a church that prays, a church that proclaims, a church that cares, a church that shares and a church that does not give in to violence. In a moment, we'll be opening God's word together and hearing from our speaker for this week on one of those themes. But before we do that, let's join it together as we reflect and hear and sing along with a worship song. And welcome to our online sermon this week for St Mary's, week beginning the 3rd of April. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather together around your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be at work within us, 
and that you would do in our hearts and minds the work that you intend and that you would leave only your truth amongst us and bring forth your fruit. Amen. Amen. So we're in our sermon series uh, of thinking about the early church in the first few chapters of Acts. We've thought about over the last few weeks a church that proclaims, a church that prays, a church that cares and a church that shares. And uh, this week, as we look at Acts chapter 5, or a passage from Acts chapter 5, the title that we've been given is A Church That Did Not Give In to Violence. We might uh, reframe that and think of it as a church that didn't let violence stop it, didn't let persecution silence it. Our reading that we're going to be looking at today is from Acts chapter 5, um, verses 17 to 33. The Apostles Persecuted so Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail, but during the night an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, with guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and saviour, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these, these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honoured by all the people, stood up in Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while while he addressed them. Well, this story of the Apostles' trial before the Sanhedrin uh, comes on the heels of their miraculous escape, once again uh, from prison. Uh, this motif of escape from prison becomes a familiar theme throughout the book of Acts, including in chapter 12, where an angel helps uh, Peter break out of jail. Later in chapter 15, Peter and Silas are again broken free by uh, a divine intervention from the jail in Philippi. Uh, all this kind of points to the context that they're in, that the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ is landing them in trouble. Bear in mind, this isn't that long after the crucifixion itself and the resurrection appearances of Jesus. Uh, the word of this Jesus, risen from the dead, is spreading throughout Jerusalem. The authorities are having a real um, hard time keeping a lid on it. They wanted to stop it with executing Jesus. That hasn't worked. Now, the apostles are continuing to preach in the name of Jesus. Uh, they've already been arrested for this before in Acts chapter 4. If you flick back, uh, then you'll read that um, uh, they were teaching in the temple about Jesus and his resurrection. And there they were arrested also. And this is the second time now that 
Peter has spoken on behalf of themselves and all the disciples that they cannot stop talking about Jesus. They cannot t stop talking about such things. Not surprisingly then, we're in this position where the high priest has had them arrested yet again, for they continue to talk about Jesus. So what's the issue here? Why are they getting into trouble? Well, their teaching and healing ministry is perpetuating the teaching and healing ministry of Christ and is bringing people to faith in him. They are filling Jerusalem uh, with their this teaching, with the name of Jesus, that the, the high priests, Pharisees and Sadducees have worked so hard to try and quell. In the midst of that, of course, it isn't just that they are healing and teaching about Jesus. They're also perpetuating Jesus's claim that he was capable of forgiving sins. They have declared that Jesus is the ruler and the saviour, the only one by which humankind could be saved. We know that from Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus presented a challenge to both the religious and political authorities of his day. From the high priest and the Sadducees' perspective, um, their teaching, their preaching, perpetuated the claims of Christ to be the Son of God. Peter's suggestion in this story that God exalted the crucified Christ that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel perpetuates that claim to forgive. Remember, this is the Jesus that the Pharisees said, do you claim to forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. From a Roman and a political uh, perspective, this Jesus set up as the king of kings, the one who is capable of being saviour, is a direct challenge to the rule and reign of the emperor. Augustus Caesar was the sole saviour of the world and the healer of it. The authorities would have been deeply invested in depicting the emperor as saviour. Likely, this preaching of Jesus as saviour would have been seen as a direct challenge and threat to the Roman Empire. But the power of the institutions of their day was not going to stop these Christians talking about their Jesus and the gospel that he proclaimed. Peter here has insisted that they're only going to obey God rather than humans. It, it replicates what they said in the previous chapter, forcefully articulating that they've got this obligation to preach what they'd witnessed. And and beyond their beyond their decision to continue talking about Jesus, beyond their decision to not uh, bow to the human uh, institutions that would silence them, their miraculous escape from prison reminds us that God is at work in this as well. God is propelling this movement forward. This is not just. Um, human bloody mindedness to continue speaking when they've been asked not to there is also a movement of God here at work um, amongst them and within their community the authority of the high priest and the Sadducees hasn't been obeyed they're not getting their way simply by virtue of their status or their social or religious position and their vociferous demands God's word and God's purposes transcend the power of human authority is what we see in this chapter of Acts and elsewhere in the book of Acts also. This story of Peter, just like the previous chapter, uh, speaks to the resilience and the indefatigable spirit of the Jesus movement. This message about Jesus, which they'd hoped to stop first with a Roman cross and now with repeated orders and jail cells, is seemingly unstoppable. It's gone viral. It's filling Jerusalem. The leaders have lost their ability to control and manage. 
And to be honest, I think in the passage they sound a little bit desperate. So what made the early church so resilient in the face of this opposition? What was it that enabled them to be so certain that they were going to carry on talking about Jesus and not let the human institutions kind of curtail them or cow them or silence them? I kind of figure there's a number of things. One, of course, is the work of the Holy Spirit uh, around them and within them, but also the transforming power of the Spirit within them. Remember, these are the same disciples who met together in the upper room with all the doors locked for fear of the religious authorities of their day. Now, imbued with the Holy Spirit within them, they've become transformed. They've discovered a boldness that has come from the power of the Holy Spirit at work within them. Secondly, they have seen Jesus die under the weight of Roman authority and power, the greatest power in the world in their day, had killed Jesus on a cross and they'd seen Jesus overcome it. They'd seen Jesus rise from the dead. Even the power of Rome could not keep this Jesus down. And he rose from the dead and led them into new life, full of all the possibilities that Jesus had promised. They'd witnessed it for themselves, that the ultimate institution of their world, the ultimate power of their world, had been beaten and thwarted by this man, Jesus. And so, thirdly, they had bought into the promise of the coming of the kingdom of God and was standing on their belief of God's rule and reign over all things coming to pass, where earthly power and institutions would be done away with and replaced with Christ's rule and uh, 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 reign. And, and fourthly, it struck me that, of course, they believed that Jesus was coming back and could come back at any moment and at that point in time bring the fullness of the kingdom of God to bear. These things surely are the things that underpin their determination to continue speaking about Jesus. So what about us? I don't know that in Ely we live in an age of such resistance and such oppression and opposition and persecution to the gospel in response to the gospel. We are very unlikely uh, in this country to be arrested for our faith. And though, of course, that is not the case throughout the world. And we must remember that we have brothers and sisters in Christ who today languish in prison because of their faith, because of their decision to proclaim Christ uh, boldly. We, though, might find that there are times when sharing our faith or where people knowing of our faith provokes a very strong reaction in them. In our passage, there's some real tension where Peter um, tells the high priest and the Sadducees that God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. I, I think it's probably fair to say that the leaders, the high priest and the Sadducees, could rightly think that the disciples are aiming for vengeance, either human or divine, directed against them. In their fear and self-defence, it seems as though the leaders would be willing to have the disciples killed, bar the intervention of this individual called Gamaliel. But notice, Peter is not arguing for vengeance. Uh, Peter points out that God's purpose in overturning the death of Christ by raising him from the dead and by, by thwarting their violent motives uh, was not to condemn and destroy, but instead to offer the gift of repentance and forgiveness. The gracious surprise of this text is that the result of Jesus' uh, resurrection is not vengeance but mercy. 
Sometimes even the message of God's forgiveness and mercy and grace can provoke a threatened response, can provoke a strong reaction in others. I fear that sometimes folk hear not the grace and mercy, but only the accusation that they've done wrong. What do I need forgiveness for? What are you telling me? You see, we might find there's times when sharing our faith or where people know of our faith that we've got an image problem to overcome. Some fear that we might peddle that holier-than-thou Christian approach. And sadly, there have been times when the church at large has, I think, deformed the gospel. Where church leaders and church folk at times have proclaimed God's wrath on those people, whoever they might be. Those that perhaps threaten a sense of position, authority or false sense of security. We know that the church and church leaders and church people have not always spoken grace and mercy. And there'll be times where people have heard that message of condemnation. And so when we bring news of Christ, wanting to bring good news of Christ, we find that there's a reaction against it because of what perhaps has gone before, what people have heard before. The poor witness of others creates a hostile reaction in some. And lastly, though we might not face active hostility towards our message of hope in Christ, in fact, often we find that people are open and curious about it, we nonetheless might find times where we encounter, encounter an attitude that suggests our faith should be kept private and not offered publicly. Or, and perhaps this is more insidious, we find ourselves part of a society or, or of institutions or of community that have aspects about them that are unjust or unfair or oppressive towards sectors of society and, and might find that there is some pressure not to challenge the status quo. We might find that our message of hope and peace and reconciliation and the justice of the kingdom of God risks becoming cowed and silenced, not because someone is being abjectly violent towards us or directly opposing us, but because to speak out in those settings, to say what is right and what is of God in those settings, challenges human authority and institution. And that means to risk losing institutional approval or, 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 or a place in community and potential alienation from others. Might there be times where we need to lift our voices to proclaim the gospel in defence of others and risk what that might bring if it's not popular or doesn't fit in with what's considered the norm? We are, after all, supposed to embody good news to the poor, the imprisoned and those oppressed for whatever reason, whether it's because of their, their religious affiliation, culture, gender, race, class or anything else. And we might well find that the authorities and communities to which we often submit and associate don't always side with the oppressed or with justice. Whilst we might not face direct opposition, we might find that the systems and institutions of which we're a part cow us to silence, when in fact we should be those that speak of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think discipleship, following in the way of Jesus, is always going to be lived out in the midst of a clash between the coming of the kingdom of God and the version of the world pursued by other powers that we encounter in daily life. In our passage in Acts, we hear the Peter saying that the church will only obey God rather than any human authority or institution. And that claim has sustained the church faithfully in her witness, in countless countries and settings and contexts where political and military powers have demanded other allegiances. And none of this should surprise us. 
God is in the business of overturning, of bringing his kingdom to bear in our world, overturning systems of government and society that are not right and unjust. We should not be surprised that proclaiming the way of Christ Jesus potentially leads us into conflict of different kinds. The very death of Jesus being overturned by God's raising of Jesus to new life is an act from which flows the promise that everything will change, that all things will be made new. So just as the early church noticed all things flow from the person of Christ Jesus, just as they were not silenced or cowed in the face of opposition and persecution, nor should we hold back in our proclamation of Jesus Christ as Lord and King over all and as the only one through whom rescue and salvation for our broken world can ultimately come in fullness. In our places of work, in our communities, amongst our friends, we, like the early church, should allow ourselves to be drawn by the Holy Spirit at work within us to stand boldly on our belief of the coming of the kingdom of God. Where earthly powers and institutions and systems will be done away with and replaced with Christ's reign and rulership boldly speaking out against anything where we see injustice or oppression of others. For we too, like the early church, know of a Christ who has overcome all things, even death on a cross, and who we believe is seated at the right hand of God to rule and reign, and all things shall be placed under his feet. And our message, like that of the early church, is not one of replacing a, a domineering system with another, but is an invitation to know God's grace, mercy and forgiveness and to do life rightly in partnership with him, in partnership with God's ways. Our belief also is that Christ can return at any moment and bring his kingdom rule to bear in all its fullness in the here and now. So in any circumstance, in any situation, in any setting, what should be the thing that drives us in our thinking and in our speaking and in our doing and in our acting? Surely it is our trust in Christ as king and ruler over all, rather than our trust in any worldly system or institution. We should be driven by a right attitude towards God and towards the coming of his kingdom and our part in it, rather than be given over to fear of anyone else. Why would we stay silent? How? Can we stay silent when we know the gift that is Christ and the promise of God's kingdom? It is the very call of God in Christ Jesus, on our lives and for his sake and his purposes that we should place in all circumstances and in all places over and above all other things. May we pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of your Spirit that leads and calls us into life with you. We pray that you would make us very bold and courageous in standing for the things of you that are right and true. We pray that you would convict us all the more of the promise of your kingdom and of the one in whom all things are intended to hold together in the person of Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, that you would enable us to witness boldly to you in every circumstance and situation and that you would help us not to allow anything to silence us or to cause us to hold back in our sharing of the good news in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Well, thank you for joining us for this week's online worship. If you want to be in touch with us for any reason, uh, with comments or questions or concerns or anything else, do make use of the contact details for the ministry team, which are available on the St Mary's website. There'll also be information on the website about things going on during Holy Week and Easter, and of course about all our regular activities too. And just a reminder that at the moment, the building itself is closed because of our building transformation project. So anything happening at the church will take place in the church rooms. To get there, you go past Oliver Cromwell's house and turn left and through the Rickeridge car park. And it is signposted from there. But for now, let's end our service with some words and a prayer from Ephesians chapter three. So let's pray that out of God's glorious riches, he may strengthen us with power through his spirit in our inner beings, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And let's pray that being rooted and established in love, we may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that we might be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. So to God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, which is at work in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.